two, one. Welcome today to the subject matter expert lecture series that's hosted by the Intelligence Systems and Geosciences Research Coordination Network. Today, I'm really happy to welcome Ibrahim Demir, who is um, a faculty member at the University of Iowa in the Hydroinformatics Lab. Ibrahim really is pushing the envelope in terms of how to apply artificial intelligence methodologies, um, both at the interface level as well as the underlying cyber infrastructure level, um, both through advanced research activities and applied research that reaches out into the community. And today he's going to share with us some of the recent advances that he's achieved um, in his work. Ibrahim, thank you for joining us. All right, uh, thank you. Thank you, Suzanne, for the invitation and also the introduction. So today uh, I'd like to present a recent work that we are working on uh, creating an interactive and real-time flood inundation system. It's entirely running on client-side web systems. So this is a, a, an integrated environment that integrates uh, data and an entire map in, uh, generation process on the web on the client side. So I'd like to start with some basic uh, background on the, the mapping. So uh, in Iowa, as a part of Iowa Flood Center, we have been involved in many uh, flood map inundation, uh, flood inundation map generation uh, activities. So recently, uh, Iowa Flood Center finished statewide inundation maps uh, with the support from FEMA. It was a five-year uh, project in, in, uh, with the $10 million funding. So it's a big effort to create inundation map maps for entire state. Even though it was created over the last five years, there are still areas that we are missing critical data and, and maps are not entirely 100% covering Iowa. And there are lots of challenges generating flood inundation maps, especially at this large scale. But even you, you do it at the community level, and that, they, uh, that then involves a lot of uh, data collection and surveying and collecting uh, bathymetry and, and cross sections and creating uh, rating curves and other efforts is required during this process. It's a very time consuming, uh, definitely a, a, a resource intensive effort involves uh, hydraulics and hydrology and many other uh, effort and physical modeling, but also it is a computationally expensive process. So, uh, and once you have this data, then it's, it's great that you can use it in, in many uh, uh, levels of flood preparedness, uh, response and recovery effort is critical for understanding the, the areas that will be uh, under flooded and also uh, gives you an idea of uh, how much damage you expect from a specific scenario. So in Iowa, we have generated uh, flood inundation maps for eight different return periods from two years to five and 10, up to 500 year flood maps. Also, we have generated over 5,000 flood inundation maps for communities. It's a very high resolution, one meter resolution maps for every half foot scenario. So this, some, some areas has over 50 maps representing 50 different half foot increments, but also in some areas like Ames and Des Moines where two rivers merge, we have a 30 combination from both rivers, which creates a combination of 900 inundation maps for some areas. So it's an extensive process, which requires a lot of time, resources computationally and in data wise, very expensive process. And it, it can be used as you see from here, this example shows us a loss and damage estimation for a city rapids, a flood situation, so you can easily change the flood map and connect with another uh, damage estimation and model. And similarly, it can be used with uh, vulnerability and resilience analysis, as well as real-time uh, routing and other transportation-related uh, efforts. So you could connect all these uh, valuable data sets uh, from inundation maps to carry out this kind of secondary analysis. But as I said earlier, doing that at a, at a large scale will be very, very uh, time uh, uh, and computationally and time-wise a very expensive process. But still, even though we have generated a recently a map a library for Iowa, it's already five, six years old. And many things changed on the terrain since then. There were lots of large scale federal grants that, uh, uh, supported infrastructure changes uh, on the terrain, uh, creating levees, uh, waterways, 
and many uh, mitigation efforts, which will affect the terrain, which will affect the corresponding flood map. So most of the maps in Iowa now, because of these changes, should be updated, which will also require similar efforts and similar resources. So uh, that's why the, the, the FEMA maps, as you, if you can look at the entire CONUS, entire US uh, libraries, uh, it's relatively old and missing a lot of areas. This is definitely critical and also challenging for uh, effective flood mitigation and, and preparedness and response activities. So in this project, we looked into uh, some uh, GIS and data-driven methods to generate flood inundation maps in real time with an interactive structure and based on selected scenarios. So the goal here is not to generate or pre-compute maps using GIS or some large computational efforts and then serve the map in some, some sort of pseudo real-time mode, but the idea is entirely generating the map from scratch in real time with the user input. So we looked into several uh, flood inundation uh, approaches. There are lots of uh, GIS-based approach. And in recently, uh, we have seen uh, a method, a statistical, I mean, a, a data-driven method uh, is, is started to be used by uh, the researchers and recently by the National Water Center. Uh, the hand uh, method here, the height above nearest drainage, is the method selected uh, with the, by the National Water Center for large-scale flood inundation map generation. There are uh, limited studies on the, the accuracy and the capabilities of this uh, approach, but it was studied for the last 10 years. There are lots of applications, not just for flood mapping, but also other areas of hydrological modeling. This, this approach is used. So we started to investigate this method and also looked at recent studies on generating flood inundation maps by hand. And we're also running our own evaluation study and recent uh, values I and mean, the results from our evaluation study shows up to like 80 to 90, 95% accuracy or matching with the FEMA maps on many areas, depending on the resolution, depending on the data availability, especially by the elevation data that you need or the hand model, uh, you might get up to 95% or higher uh, matching with the FEMA maps. And definitely FEMA maps are also based on hydraulic and hydrologic models. So it's, it's not exactly the ground truth, but still it's a good approximation of the flood inundation. So there's definitely, uh, there's a good correlation, there's a good match between the, the physical based models versus the data driven models like HAND. So we started to uh, work on an implementation of HAND. Uh, so in, in general, just a quick summary, uh, so you can check this article uh, from 2011, one of the first introductions about the HAND method. And here, when you, uh, the hand model starts by uh, a digital elevation model, elevation data set for an area. And then uh, from that uh, step, all the way down to generating flood inundation map, all the steps are computed with uh, either, a, either through a GIS application or a desktop application with Python. But our goal here was to integrate all these steps uh, all the way from the elevation data from scratch and uh, to the end point as generating the flood inundation maps. The, map, the, the process starts with elevation data and then the, in the second step you generate the flow directions and clean up the, the terrain and uh, remove the depression points and, and all the issues in the connectivity, generate a connected connectivity map and create the, the flow directions on the area and then calculate the drainage area and then sub catchments in that uh, watershed or the area and then generate a hand model. And using this model, you could add a water over this area and generate a flood inundation map. So it's more like a four or five uh, step process, still computationally intensive, but at least you start from scratch, from the elevation data, all the way uh, to go to the uh, inundation map generation. So today, most of the approaches uh, that utilizes hand model is still not exactly real time, even though most of them is uh, calling them real time. Usually they pre-compute the hand model based on the elevation data, still a, a computation ex uh, expensive process. Usually they depend on a GIS based processing, creating the uh, uh, hand model, pre-compute it and serve it from uh, a, a, a server uh, through a GIS application. And they usually cookie cut the hand model based on the water level. So it is 
more like a pseudo real time application that just serves the data from a server side GIS application and cookie cuts the map based on the user input. So you could generate a flood inundation map for selected water levels in a reference point. It just serves that data from a server side GIS application and visualizes on the map. Our goal here is to eliminate the server side computation because we want to have the full power uh, on the user side where user can uh, entirely control the map parameters and many other terrain characteristics. So we have moved the hand calculation entirely to the web, to the client side on the user's machine without any downloads, entirely running on the web, inside the web application. So once you eliminate that process, then there are lots of uh, in, uh, exciting opportunities start to emerge. So once you have this uh, hand model in the client side uh, environment, you can uh, create more capabilities. So before moving forward, I'd like to give you a quick up, uh, update on recent web technologies and how uh, the web evolved in recent years for the last maybe like 20, uh, 20 30 years. And, and there are some, here are some of the recent web technologies either in development or recently released or available for some time, but uh, not fully uh, utilized. So on one side, uh, we, we, we can now access the full power of the GPUs, the graphical processing units from the web without any software entirely running with web technologies. We can run the computationally extensive analysis, visualizations utilizing the GPU. The WebGL and WebGPU are the libraries uh, either available for some time. It's a low level language, but still part of the web. You can in, entirely script in, in uh, and write the code in JavaScript. Similarly, WebAssembly is another evolving technology on the web, uh, supported by uh, major web browsers, where you can run desktop level languages like C++ and others on the web without any modification, which will create a, a very powerful engine for your analysis and visualization. And on the communication side, the web XR, the, the mixed reality and virtual reality environments are now fully supported by the browsers. You can create a website where you can launch on your uh, virtual reality or augmented reality headset and have a fully immersive environment without any software download. And then the web workers and WebCL supports computational capabilities on the web where you can run multi-threaded parallel processing uh, uh, scripts and programs on the web. And similarly, the web SQL and the web storage allows you to store large scale data as large as your, your hard drives, and run offline applications, and downloading gigabytes of data and running a large application entirely on the web is possible through these uh, technologies. So go, coming back to the environment that we talked about, so creating the entire hand uh, calculations on the web. So once we have this kind of framework, what else we can do with that? So I'm gonna just show some of the potential uh, capabilities we can achieve through this framework and then I will show you a small demo of the system. So once we have the capability entirely on the web on the client side, we can create another layer between the elevation data and the web application. This is also running entirely on the web, which allows us the terrain modification. For example, you can do some mitigation efforts, resampling and other changes on the terrain directly on the web, which allows you to run the flood inundation maps for different resolutions, to run flood inundation maps with modified terrain data. So you can add a levy, you can add a waterway channel, you can add a sandbox around your house and rerun the model in seconds. So idea here is to give the user the full power of modifying the terrain by adding mitigation efforts at their house level, maybe community level or at the city level and see the results instantly. So idea behind these mitigation scenarios is, is very critical where uh, you are expecting a flood within hours, within days, and you want to see a different scenario where you can protect a specific asset. So you can look at adding a small water wall, like a, a barrier, flood barrier to an area like a street, your house, and then you can uh, easily see the result instantly on the web. So the idea is to give the full power to the user for terrain modification. And second uh, maybe area we can uh, definitely invest is data analytics. Once we have this, real-time mapping capabilities, you can easily connect them to some of the analysis that I mentioned in the early slides about damage and loss assessment. So we already have 
uh, that version of Pima hazard the uh, hazards uh, program. So we have deployed entire hazards and uh, damage assessment system to the web in recent years. And now we can connect that to a real-time mapping system. So you can see if I add a levy here, what will be the potential damage in my community based on this upcoming flood uh, uh, risk. So you can easily look at these changing scenarios and connect them with this damage and loss estimation on the web by using this real-time system. And similarly, if I elevate a road or a, a bridge, how will this affect the transportation network? So it will also give you the routing capabilities. So we have created a real-time routing system for Department of Transportation in Iowa, where you can select point A and point B. It will show you how to access these areas before and after flood uh, conditions. So you can easily see if I add a, a, a mitigation maybe uh, effort in this area, how will this affect my routing potential or evacuation scenarios in my community? And, and, and finally, you can also connect the real-time maps to a risk analysis and demographic uh, system. So it will give you so vulnerability and resilience analysis as well. So these are opening up many, many potential once we have the real-time capabilities. And on the central side here, where we have this real-time hand system, then we can look into how we can further improve the hand model and get closer to the, the uh, uh, real world situations and also maybe even uh, get closer to FEMA maps or, or even better to the uh, true uh, results of the flood inundation. So there are several ways that we are looking now into improving the hand model by using data assimilation, looking at the observational data in the terrain so we can connect the stream gauges to hand model and assign the water levels based on observations. We can also connect with the, the flood forecasting model and generate the flood inundation maps based on the forecasted stream flow of information on the terrain. So you can say at 5 p.m. tomorrow, this is the forecasted water level or the discharge, and we will give you the corresponding flood inundation maps based on hand. So definitely, uh, the hand can be further improved in terms of accuracy and get closer to the, the real world situations and the female maps by adding more data flood map models, focus models. Oh, definitely there. Yes. I was just going to say your sound got messed up for a minute, but I think it's okay again. So yeah, what was the last thing that <laughs> you heard? This is hopefully not too much. No, no, earlier. it was just a couple of words, so it was okay. Okay. So. Yeah, so I was talking about how we can further improve the uh, hand models using data simulation, observations, and models, and also uh, how we can further improve the computational capabilities of hand. So we already implemented the WebAssembly version of the hand and also the pure JavaScript uh, capabilities. We are looking into also utilizing the WebCL and the WebGL libraries to further speed up the process and handle large scale, larger data sets and regions in the area. And um, so this is the complete picture, starting entirely from the elevation data, allowing users to do terrain modifications, running the hand model entirely on the web, generating foundation map, and then connecting to these secondary data analytics capabilities for damage assessment, the routing, and also the vulnerability and resilience. So this is the complete picture. This is our vision, and we are working towards that vision, and we already completed the core components of that environment. So I'd like to start by showing you some uh, screenshots. I don't want to uh, run some real-time demos right now because of the, the connectivity, but we already have this real-time system up and running. We are now working on a paper for the evaluation. We are running a very large scale comprehensive evaluation of the uh, hand model compared to uh, female maps. And I'll be able to share hopefully the paper in the coming weeks. Uh, we'll probably put it on the uh, Earth Archive as well, so you can access earlier. But also, we'll be working on uh, in implementing this entire hand uh, real-time system to a large-scale domain like Iowa, for operational and also public use. So I'd like to start by showing you some of the screenshots of the system. So as, a, as an early study, we started by connecting to the system to a large domain in Iowa. So it's covering like five counties. Uh, as big as like 100 uh, mile uh, by 100 mile range. 
So the system allows you to select a resolution of the elevation data. You can start even up to one meter resolution all the way up to 50 meter resolution. If you are running for like a small city, you can use one meter resolution as big as like five kilometer by five kilometer range. If you want to run for entire maybe county, you can go to 10 meter resolution. If you want to run for entire even state, you can go to like 50 meter resolution and run the entire state or large portion of the state in matter of seconds. And second, you, you choose the dimension of the area. You can select a one meter resolution, but you can select maybe three kilometer range or five kilometer range, or you can choose a 25 meter resolution and select an area as big as 50 meter or, or 50 kilometer or 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer range in the system. You can also select data either through a bare earth data, just the terrain, or you can select a data set that includes the building. So you can also run around the buildings as well. So we have a couple of options in the system that you can select the elevation, the resolution and area, as well as the data source. Once you have this, so for example, I'm gonna select an area in the Cedar Rapids area here. I'm just selecting the one meter resolution, three kilometer by three kilometer area. And then I'm requesting the bare earth maps, or I can select the, the, uh, the building maps. Where I can run the hand model. And similarly, I can select a larger area, like uh, almost as large as a county, like 10 meter resolution, 25 kilometer by 25 kilometer. I can request the, the bare earth data here in this example, and I can generate the hand map. As you can see, uh, the, the map is generated for this kind of 25 kilometer by 25 kilometer region, which, com which includes at least six, seven uh, communities in Iowa, like cities in Iowa. And on the right side, you can see some of the critical parameters. So you can define the drainage area, uh, which is a critical criteria for hand model. So how much area will drain to a point where it will be counted as a drainage point in the system. And then you define the amount of water on the terrain. So for, which is the hand value here, which I'm selecting 13 feet of uh, water over the hand model will be our flood inundation map. You can easily adjust. And as you adjust, it will instantly calculate within a millisecond. So you can easily add and add, remove water, adjust the water levels based on the expected scenario. And also you can uh, filter further using elevation data, stream order, some other characteristics as well. And everything is calculated on the fly using the web technologies. So we are not getting the stream order from NHT plus or somewhere else. We are not getting the, uh, flow directions or any information, everything is starting from the bare error elevation data and all the internal steps are entirely calculated on the web. And then... Can I ask a question, Ibrahim? Excuse me? Can I ask a question? Sure, yes. Um, yeah, so when you were speaking before, um, you said that hand was computationally expensive, right? But here you're saying that everything is calculated on the client. So why, what is the problem with uh, pre-calculating the flooding maps? Yeah, so the, the hand is computation expensive if you are running for a very large domain at the very large resolutions. Mm -hmm. So here we allow users to run hand model at one meter resolution, usually for a smaller area like five kilometers. Or if you choose 10 meter or 50 meter resolution, you can run as large as 100 kilometer range. So since it's a, it's like mostly if you want to run hand, usually you might want to run hand at the, at the highest resolution. And everything I've seen from the, the industrial or the, the uh, companies or from the research groups, they usually generate the hand model using a GIS system and serve it from server side and serve it to the client side using a GIS uh, service. And then you generate the hand map, but it doesn't allow you to change the terrain. It just generates the map through this GIS system and serves to the client side. So this is the first step. If I stop here, it will be very similar to what they do right because i could serve the hand from a gis application at the one meter resolution for the entire us entire uh, even globe but this is not the first this is not the entire system that we are talking so i'm talking about a system where you can generate real time but also allow you to change the terrain in real time so this is the first step so this is where we start differentiating between the other you know, pseudo real time systems so let me continue Rain, sorry, you mean changing the parameters for drainage area and hand that you have on the right, correct? Yes, yeah, so for example, the other system doesn't allow you to change the drainage area because this area criteria is critical. If you say 
uh, I prefer to use the drainage area criteria to be around three square kilometers, it will generate a totally different map, which you don't have the option in other real-time systems because they are all pre-computed and served to a server and they use best value for the drainage area as they can estimate. And but it doesn't give you the power to change it on the floor. So, well, the, 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 reasons, the reason why I'm asking this is because we, we also have the model in, uh, in one of our projects, hand model. Yes. Um, well, I know that Susan's team has been in contact with uh, with you in some uh, at some point about this, right? And and of course, if you don't want to pre compute to pre compute everything, you can you can submit a job and then wait until until it gets done, right? But this yeah. is so uh, okay. I, I just wanted to understand the the workflow here. Thank you. Yeah. So you can change the drainage area, you can change the resolution, you can change the region and everything. And then even the data source. If you have a different, for example, elevation data source, you can connect and you can run again. So definitely there are lots of flexibility, even right now, before coming to the, the train modification. Or if you look at the hand map versus the FEMA map, uh, even in this region with limited adjustments of the parameters or optimizations, you can see it's matching 80 to 85% or more uh, with the just a couple of clicks. Now we generate the map, and here's the FEMA maps that is generated for the entire Iowa with this $10 million five-year project. And this is the hand map generated in seconds in the system. And you can easily adjust the drainage parameters, hand parameters, and in further improve the elevation data maybe in the background and generate a maybe more matching map uh, compared to FEMA maps. But this is just the first step. Next. Hey, what does the elevation mean, sorry? Excuse me? What does the, the elevation mean? Yeah, so the elevation data is the, the raw data that we start generating the hand maps. So we start from the elevation data set. So if you have a new elevation data, like for example, Iowa started recently to collect elevation data using the LIDAR survey last year. So we will have a recent, more recent, and maybe more correct elevation data coming from the LIDAR source in the coming month. So I can- No, what I'm asking is, um, it's a, what does the elevation parameter mean on the right that says 900? Ah, yeah, sorry. So the elevation parameter here is, you can uh, adjust an elevation parameter here to limit the water. You can say, we don't want water to pass that elevation point, like thousand feet from sea surface. So you can adjust this parameter to further keep some areas out of the water because of a specific maybe criteria on the elevation. You can say, don't uh, want the water to reach this elevation level because of some specific maybe reasoning. So the, you can further uh, limit and clean up. And then similarly, the stream order allows you to compute the stream orders for the entire domain that you see now. And then you can say, I don't want water or, or see the flood maps for stream order one and two and three. I just want to see for the larger rivers and stuff like that. So you can also adjust the stream order and, and further filter the uh, inundation map generated for these areas mm -hmm. as well. Okay, yeah. so this yeah. is how it looks between the FEMA maps and then the, the hand elevation. And next step is the terrain modification. If you look at the, for example, Cedar Rapids map, there's an area where the water connects to a larger domain because of this uh, either a leak in the river system or there's a connection with the water channel to another channel in, in the nearby environment neighborhood. So what you can do here is you can use the DEM uh, tools here on the right side. You can add some uh, levees or uh, uh, the, you can add some infrastructure uh, uh, components to elevate the area or uh, you can also lower the area in elevation. For example, you can create a small channel between two areas. You can connect the water and then you can let the water drain to another area by lowering the, the elevation data or increasing the, raising the, the elevation data. And then you can burn this change to the terrain and then you can recalculate the hand instantly. So one example here is I have selected this area to create a small levee. It's probably a couple of hundred a feet or like a mile range. So you can uh, generate a small levy. You can calculate the cost as well. And then you can 
look at how this will affect uh, the before and after situation. So this is the levee, before levee situation where you see flood maps are connecting to this neighborhood where it's all inundated because of this uh, small maybe channel. If you put a levee, and this is what it looks like after rerunning the hand maps. So you can generate the hand maps before and after situations within seconds, and you can adjust the location of the levee. You can just focus on one small building and, and add some uh, sandbags in the area and try to protect your uh, uh, property. You can try to protect a large, maybe industrial complex, your, your company, your, your assets uh, by using this map. So you can easily generate, this is the beforehand, before, before maps for the, the area, and here's the after area. So it will automatically cut the connection. Still, if you put a small levee, it might still go around based on the elevation data. So it's entirely uh, running on the fly and giving the user the option to change the, the modification and do the modifications on the train. And I'd like to show you a small video. Uh, Can I just, just jump in and say, this is amazing. I'm just, I'm just staying in this, wow, you can on the fly do some mitigation or some intervention and see what happens. That is just amazing. I second that. <laughs> yeah, so let's see a small Yes. No, it we gives you like all, all yeah. kind of a totally different tool to actually do something about on the spot and make decisions. That's just amazing. I had no idea you could do that. Thank you. So let me show you a real time video, which is running from my home computer, from the, the remote connection, stuff like that. So there are lots of small challenges, but still you can see the real time recording of how we can generate a flood inundation maps so for an area. So let me show you the video. So this is the real time system. I'm now gonna, I'm on Google Maps environment. I'm zooming into an area. I'm gonna select a, a, a 10, kilometer, 10, a 10 meter resolution up to 25 kilometer range. So I'm selected this, selected this area in the middle of these four counties in Iowa. And then I'm requesting the, the data set uh, from the server. It's just the elevation data. I'm also working for an offline version of the system, which will not require any server connections. And now I am generating the flood inundation map. As you can see, it took like three, four seconds to generate the flood inundation map for the area. If I change the drainage area, it will take another second. If I change the hand value, it will change, take another millisecond to generate the new map. Because once it's generated, it will take only a second or less to change the drainage area value, or it will take a couple of hundred milliseconds to redraw with a different water level. So you can easily put a slider for the water level and increase and decrease almost in real time without any uh, lag. So this is the, the three components that you can change. And then we have uh, FEMA maps are also connected to show the difference. We can also look at the difference before and after uh, images. And similarly, I also allow users to download the hand model as a data set elevation data and many other inter intermediate data sets generated by the system for allowing you to further evaluate and compare the results. So now one of my students are doing, is doing a large scale evaluation study for the area with different resolutions, different range uh, parameters, hand parameters, and looking at the sensitivity of these parameters and, and in impact on the accuracy of the flood inundation maps. One question, do you have also the code available? Because it would be great to compare against our own implementation on hand, right? And see whether uh, we get different results or the same results. Yeah, so I'm working, we are working like on two papers. One of the papers will be evaluation, which doesn't include the code because it's just a secondary evaluation paper. But the first paper on the entire system is still under preparation, development. Hopefully we'll be able to open up the code for uh, other people. I'd like to give you a quick final slide to show the, the performance of the system. For example, if you are running this environment, uh, this, this model for one to like five meter resolution for a small region like a city for up to like 10 kilometers, I have two different implementation. If you run in a web assembly, which is one of the new web libraries, you can generate the, the maps under four seconds. If you run on the, the JavaScript, the pure JavaScript, it will take two times, maybe two and a half times more, still at under 10 seconds, 
most of the cases. But if you start to scale up, you want to run for the entire county, you can go to 25 meter or 50 meters, go to like 25 to 50 kilometer range. It's still computed at the same time because at the end, it's dealing with the similar size matrix in the background. Whatever you scale up, if you keep the resolution high and the region high, then you will end up a similar outcome in terms of the computational uh, complexity. So if you are always dealing with either a million size a matrix, like thousand by thousand or 5,000 by 5,000 matrix to compute this. So uh, with the WebAssembly, it always takes longer than four seconds if you run in every, on a JavaScript. Now we are looking into further implementations on multi-CPU JavaScript versus a web GPU. It could further improve the performance and allows you to run like one meter at the county level, maybe one meter at the state level as well based on the potential improvements in the computation. So it's just a quick summary on the scaling and performance. But if you are at the county level, looking at the flood inundation maps with five meter resolution will be very, I mean, good enough for any mitigation study, especially for real time decision making. Because if you have a lot of resources, a lot of time, then you don't need to worry about hand. You can just run a model, which might take weeks or months, and then generate, uh, collect data, and everything might uh, require a lot of efforts. But at the end, you end up with a model. But in real time, especially for real time decision making, operational situations in the flood response and recovery efforts, you don't have that much time, you don't have that much resource to do that process. So the idea here is to give the uh, operation people like Homeland Security, FEMA, and others a tool that they can select certain mitigation uh, alternatives and see the results and make a decision based on this. And if you have a very powerful computer, then it will be also powerful. So you could even further see speed ups as an operational maybe agency. You can have a really good computer with the high memory and then the CPU capabilities. And these numbers will go down because this is entirely dependent on the user's machine. So you, if you have a modern computer, you will see similar numbers. If you have better computers, you could have lower uh, numbers on the uh, computation time. It's just a quick overview of the entire system. And, and, and there are some uh, ideas that we are now exploring to further parallelize the computation using WebGL and WebGPU. Also, we are now working, uh, I'm working with another student to create an offline version using the web storage and SQL for uh, creating a small handheld application using web bundles. And I can create a small package of elevation data, hand model, and even a map server, a, a small map system that you can run offline on your tablet or smartphone, and you can easily pass it to another user without internet, just through Bluetooth. You could have an offline version of this on the field without requiring any computational server or some other resource. And then we are also working forward on creating a guideline on hand values based on sensors as a reference point or, or uh, the flood forecast models, and also looking into further improving the hand results using the data simulation, dynamic hand value assignment. As you can see from these results, I'm only assigning a single value everywhere, which is also reducing the, the accuracy somehow because you don't expect to have similar water levels everywhere in a flood situation. So we're also now working on assigning custom values in the region in a single hand calculation. Still, it will not affect the computation, but give you more power on adjusting the water levels in different areas, further get closer to the uh, FEMA maps or even to the reality on the ground. And also we are working on a couple of other ideas on generating secondary data sets like real channel geometries, rating curve estimation, and other information through this hand model as a secondary uh, data set uh, or, or analysis for us to support future uh, forecast studies. So just a quick update on this. Yeah, so uh, you can see some of the results and also the publications and the project pages on our website. We are now updating with a new video. So you will see hopefully in the coming weeks uh, the hand model and the real-time mapping system. But you can also see how we can communicate. So most of the analysis I mentioned in the beginning was all there now with the images and videos. So you can check our uh, uh, project website and the, the group website on hydroinformatics.ui.edu. And I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have time as well. Wonderful. Ibrahim, thank you so very much. This is a great presentation. Um, let's open it up for any questions. Does anyone 
have anything that they'd like to ask Ibrahim now? I have a question. Okay. Um, this is Emma. So I, I, I'm just blown away. I was just sitting there. My eyes were getting wider and wider as to what you can do in real time and how, how useful such a tool is. So my next question is, of course, uh, is that operational anywhere yet? Is it planned to be operational? How far will this go? And especially because we often wonder whether we should put our things, make some, you know, in the process of making something uh, operational, how do you decide whether it's good enough yet? How, what the quality control is, how to test this because we don't have much data, right? Yes, so definitely the, the uh, evaluation of the accuracy is critical. I've seen a couple of studies in the literature I think one of them is run by the David Maitman, some others from the National Water Center groups. Uh, they're not really as comprehensive as we expect, but still, uh, uh, even my group is running a large scale comprehensive assessment for the uh, hand accuracy based on these parameters. And we are uh, planning to uh, uh, submit to the article to the Earth Archive. So we have already run an, a, an assessment for the accuracy of those hand, genera hand generated maps compared to FEMA maps. So mm -hmm. the best we have right now is FEMA maps that is generated through these advanced hydrological and hydraulic models uh, based on uh, lots of surveys on the ground. So these are the best data that we have. So we are comparing ourselves with FEMA maps. And for most areas, especially with high resolution and smaller areas, we have accuracy up to like 95% matching with the FEMA maps and there's still challenges in the terrain because it changed recently. I mean, definitely at the time that we, the, the people use the, the elevation data for FEMA maps is not maybe exactly the same what we are using. So the mismatch could be caused by the data challenges, data issues. So still uh, we are seeing 90, 95% match for smaller regions as you go uh, larger. Definitely the, the, the reduced resolution affecting the performance by 80%, 85%. But we could generate small areas and, and merge them into a single large map as well. And if you are looking, and especially for mitigation efforts, you don't want to see a, a small levee somewhere around very upstream area and then go down to 100 miles and see the effect. Usually when you put a levee, you are looking to a community and you want to see the results for the community, so which is available in our system. But as I said, there is no system available to run for the entire state or entire county in seconds. So this is also uh, a most, uh, make it more powerful so for quick checking of mitigation options you have. But in terms of operations, so I, I'm also managing the Ivo flood information system where we have over 300,000 users operationally running a system for the last 10 years, and we also designed the, the Big Sioux River, the South Dakota River flood information system as well. And we are talking with the, the Missouri and, and Kansas and a couple of other states. And recently, Texas visits us in, the, in January, where we discuss about maybe creating a system for them as well. So there are lots of opportunities for us to <coughs> operationalize this system. Since I am well connected with Iowa Flood Center and others, definitely Iowa is our first, uh, first option to start operationalizing the system and giving a tool that can uh, allow them to see different scenarios. So definitely as we use the system and compare with FEMA maps, we'll see the, the accuracy and other things. But as I said, there are lots of uh, ongoing, I mean, research that can help us to further improve the, the resolution, quality of the maps and compared to FEMA. So definitely time will show us uh, what else we can see from the system and then how it compares to the FEMA maps. But uh, so definitely there's uh, some limited study available in the literature on the, the evaluation, but it's promising in terms of accuracy, like 90, 95% in many areas uh, in real time is a, is a big, I think, power for the, the decision makers. It sounds like a perfect thing for a startup company to start then doing it for lots of different states. So maybe you want to start your own startup company to do that. Yeah, I mean, definitely there's a commercial potential as well. We have actually visited by, one of the idea came from a company that visited us, Flood Center, and showed us real-time mapping system. And after I talk, I talk, how can you generate this in real time? And they said, oh, we are running on the server side and just pushing the pre-computed map. And why do you call it real time? Oh, because we can visualize in real time. No, visualization is real time always, but you are calling this real time as if you are computing in real time from scratch and you don't allow us to change anything, but these are, they're all selling in, in both in the literature and also in the, the industry, uh, real-time maps as if 
they are generating real time, more like they are visualizing real That's time. Funny. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. I think this is super cool. Um, and my question is, um, are you planning to move towards also um, other models? Because although hand, I mean, the visualizations are very impressive, it is also true that it is in scope quite simple compared to other um, hydrology models, right? In terms that, for example, it doesn't take into account the precipitation or <laughs> it, you just set the, the height and then it, it fills in based on the on the, uh, on the yeah. TDM. Mm -hmm. I mean, definitely, uh, you don't need to like, I mean, definitely you could put the, the precipitation and some other into, into effect, but it might be easier to just to use the uh, stream flow of information or the, the, the water levels or from an observation or a model to adjust your hand values everywhere, which you need to push like a 10 kilobyte data from a, a flood forecast model to the hand model and use it as an input to adjust the water levels or hand, hand values all over the, the, the range. But definitely there's an option that we can connect with the models and observations and improve the hand. But as you said, I'm also looking into other more physical models and moving them to the web. So I'm now working on uh, our hydrologic forecast model for our flood forecasting system. I'm looking into porting that to the entirely to the web, which gives the user to choose a region, a watershed, connect with the real-time data from uh, precipitation and observations, and run their own forecast model by adjusting even the model parameters on the fly in seconds. So you can start seeing the flood forecast models now running on the web. So I just started a project a couple of months ago for generating this flood forecast model on the web, on the client side, give the user power. Even though we cannot run for the entire Iowa, which requires like 400,000 hill slopes, running these millions of equations in seconds, but I could run for smaller watersheds, which could be used in education. In, in my class, I can show them, here's the watershed, select the parameter, adjust the, the model, and try to get the best forecast possible compared to the observational data from the past. So you could easily integrate to education, some research studies can be done. And then we also created a couple of years ago a distributed web computing system where you can let your uh, visitors uh, allow you to use their computation. Since it's a web library, if someone visits IPIS, IO Flood Information System, I can ask permission to run a flood forecast model or hand model at the larger scale, one meter resolution and pass one of the small components, like a chunk of data to their computer, allow them to run for five seconds as I did for smaller regions. And then I request it back to my server and merge them to create an entire Iowa one meter resolution map by passing my computations to hundred users as they are looking at my website for their own person purposes. So you could easily distribute the entire computation to hundreds of users visiting your website just to check the flood conditions or other purposes without affecting their experience on the website. I can run uh, computations on the background by asking their permissions and generate a large scale flood forecast or large scale flood inundation and serve them back and give them this kind of nice. So it's more like a science, the crowdsourcing effort for the computation. Mm -hmm. You already published an article on the distributed computing on the web, on the client side, passing the, the model uh, parameters, data, and other things, and re request the results, and nice scheduling system that passes multiple users, hundreds of users, different computation components. So I think there are also potentials for extension. And an idea here is to, to expand this framework for further areas, not just mapping, also forecast and many other areas, and create a generalized hydrological framework in the large scale, entirely running on the client side. Very cool. Super cool. All right. Um, last call for any questions, and then um, I think we'll we'll need to um, wrap up this session. I, I can leave the Zoom um, open, but I'll I'll stop the recording and um, I'll have to to head out. So, does anyone have any other questions for Ibrahim that would go on to the final video? All right, um, Ibrahim. Thank you, as always, for speaking with us. I will um, save this now. Um, I'll leave the Zoom open so folks can continue with an informal conversation after, and um, I'll post this onto the YouTube uh, channel. Um, so thank you very much. That was a fantastic presentation and really innovative thoughts. All right, thank you. I'll stay a couple of minutes if you have any other questions as well. Great.